Pokemon Scarlet and Violet are some of the most controversial Pokemon games of all time. In some ways, they're the best games in the series, but in other ways, uh... when they first released, everyone online behaved completely normally. Oh my God. Oh. That's not exactly true. People were pissed and they wanted to make sure that everybody else online knew about it. This led to a bunch of people thinking that these were some of the worst Pokemon games ever made. But now it feels like things have calmed down a fair bit and the games have been out for over a year. So I wanna know, were Pokemon Scarlet and Violet actually as bad as we thought? When the games first released and the internet erupted in complaints, I was surprisingly oblivious to all of it. I'd been avoiding the internet as much as I could because I didn't want spoilers. So all I had to base my impression of the game on was my own experiences. And as a prominent Pokemon channel, I wanted to give these games a world champion review. My score, 10 out of 10. Now, as you can imagine, this did not go over super well. Now, obviously, I'm not an idiot. I wasn't completely oblivious to the issues that these games have. But you have to keep in mind, I value different things in a video game than your average gamer. And that's especially true of a Pokemon game. Yeah, I saw the glitches, the memes, all the shortcomings of these games. I just didn't think too much of them during my own playthrough because I was having so much fun. I wasn't paid off by Pokemon, nor was I shilling for the Pokemon company. I have no issue criticizing Pokemon games when I think they're bad, but I didn't think that these games were bad. The characters, the writing, the new Pokemon design, the first open world game being actually fun to explore. These things mattered so much more to me than the visual bugs, but the games have been out for over a year now, and I have hundreds of hours playing them. So I think it's fair to give them another look and I get it now. I can see why people were so put off by Scarlet and Violet. From the very beginning, I, like many others, began to feel uneasy by the lack of information we had on these games. Leading up, it felt like we knew so much less about what to expect than we had for prior games. I told myself it must be because the Pokemon company knows that anything they or Game Freak says is going to be looked at under a microscope and probably misinterpreted. They probably also wanted to avoid having developers barraged with endless online harassment, similar to what they saw after Sword and Shield's controversial press tour. Unfortunately, all it did was postpone the inevitable. Scarlet and Violet's release made the most hated tree in video game history look like the most beloved tree. Wispy. The Pokemon company probably knew that this was going to happen, whether the games were good or not. And in the case of Scarlet and Violet, while the game is arguably one of their best on paper, it fell short in its execution, which is probably the real reason everyone involved went radio silent until the game's release. They had to know the game's performance issues were going to be more evident the more that they showed us. In fact, when given an early hands-on preview of the game, some journalists came out noting slow menus, choppy animations, and noticeable pop in. The reviewers, like us, hoped that these issues would be fixed upon release. Little did they know, almost none of the issues would be fixed even a year later. And so we arrive at launch day, November 18th, 2022. A great day for me, but a bad day to be online. After spending all night playing Pokemon Scarlet, I awoke to messages from friends linking clips of the game not looking like it came out in 2023. I was so confused. Sure, the frame rate was a little rough, but I wasn't seeing things like this in my game. I've also been in the Pokemon community for a long time, and to be honest, I feel that most things that seem to be a huge deal in the space online tend to be much smaller in reality. So at first, I thought that this time was similar. Sure, there are areas where the game is a little laggy and people popping oh, in is God. goofy, but I mean, come on, it's a Pokemon game. I'm not playing it for its hyper-realistic graphics. So even after seeing all the memes and issues people were posting online, I based my review off my own experience and gave Scarlet and Violet my highest rating. If you want, you can hear my initial thoughts here. To summarize, this was the most fun I'd had playing a Pokemon game ever. Even though most people playing the game probably didn't experience performance issues that were that massive, it didn't really matter. The entire online gaming community now believed that these games were underdeveloped developed dumpster fires. I think part of the reason why Scarlet and Violet received so much criticism is because of trends both in Pokemon and in the broader gaming sphere. It's no secret that the amount of AAA video games released in unfinished states has risen over the past few years, and we should be criticizing companies that do this. And as I mentioned, Sword and Shield received tons of criticisms when they released as well. Don't even get me started on Dexit. So this was something that everyone could rally behind. We'd seen too many big games marred by their bugs 
bug ridden release states. We'd been lied to too many times. And most importantly, the bugs were funny. Now that the games have been out for over a year, a big question we have to answer is how much do these performance issues actually affect the game? The answer is a bit complicated. There were major issues of falling through the ground and the game crashing, which is a big problem, but seem to be relatively uncommon. Whereas pop in and occasional graphic jankiness is more prevalent, but still doesn't bother me personally. One major issue that's become apparent to me as time has passed though, is how bad the lag is in certain areas. If you've played this game, in the lake, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's so bad that it genuinely feels unplayable, which is a shame because the major water area tends to be a classic part of any Pokemon game, and you can't experience it in Scarlet and Violet without being one of God's strongest soldiers. Ironically, there's one performance issue that I didn't experience at all during my playthrough, but it's totally ruined the game's first DLC for me. I was only a few hours in when I realized the game's variable frame rate was giving me motion sickness. I still haven't finished the DLC despite really wanting the reward for completing the Kitikami Pokedex as every time I play for more than 15 minutes, I feel physically ill. As my head spins, I think back to how I had waved off this game's poor frame rate in my initial review. Here it was, affecting my enjoyment just as it had countless others on that fateful launch Day. I knew then that I'd been a bit too forgiving during my initial playthrough. But before we talk about my initial playthrough, let's talk about the sponsor of today's video, Air Up. Now, when Air Up first reached out saying they wanted to sponsor a video, I almost turned them away. A product that lets you drink plain water while your brain thinks that it's flavored water using the power of special scented flavor pods? <laughs> I'll believe it when I see it. So they sent me some to try and much to my surprise, it works really well. Not only do I find myself drinking more water, but Air Up gave me extra to share with my loved one, and everyone I've given a bottle to has loved it. There are a ton of different flavor pods, so whenever I want to try something new, I can. My personal favorite is the peach one. Air Up is great if you're looking to drink more water or as a gift this holiday season. I know my loved ones love it. Gift with taste this season with Air Up. Click the link in the description to check out the limited edition bundles perfect for holiday gift giving and save up to 30 percent thanks again to air up for sponsoring this video let's talk about that initial playthrough which like all games starts in the beginning now at this point i've played through the first three or so hours of the game about five times once on my main game to beat it and the other times to use alternate cartridges to prepare for tournaments so i feel pretty qualified to talk about the game's beginning so how does the game start out in its opening minutes we're treated to our typical introduction to the Pokemon world and a fun cinematic. You're three minutes in, and besides the lack of voice acting, it's actually looking pretty promising. Well, be prepared to sit through what feels like an hour of dialogue. After you meet your mom, the school principal, and your starters, we're free to continue to the first checkpoint. At this point, it becomes apparent that Pokemon still hasn't fixed their overworld following mechanic. At this point, the game forces you to walk alongside the starters towards your next location. I literally thought my game was broken the first time because I was moving so slowly. Once we get through that slog, the game actually starts to get a little bit better. But of course, this is still the intro to a Pokemon game, and you know what that means. Reading pages and pages of text. I will say that I think voice acting would improve this section a lot, at least on the first time through. It's just not engaging to play text box simulator, and especially this early on when the characters don't have much personality, voice acting could go a long way. If you do decide to read every text box the game hurls at you, it'll probably take you around two hours to get through the game's introductory segment. I wish there were a way for veteran players to get through the section faster. I really don't need build up to my first Pokemon battle, and I certainly don't need the catching tutorial. Get us into the meat of the content and stop lingering in scenes that have already established their point. Even after this initial tutorial section, there's a fair bit you need to go through before you're actually given real freedom. This part, especially on repeat playthroughs, is a slog. There's the Koridon Miraidon introduction segment, which although not so bad the first time, is really tedious moving forward. It commits gaming's biggest sin of a trailing mission where the thing you're following moves like it needs trick room and you can't go on ahead. Can I run past it? 
No, it forces me to walk. All right, well. You then have this hilarious, I guess you'll call it a battle, versus the super overleveled Houndoom where none of your choices actually do anything. This isn't a major issue or anything. I just think it's funny. Anyway, once you get through Coridon's stomping simulator, you once again get a little more freedom. I took off running down a side path and found Wiglet and Flamigo early, which was really exciting my first time and much less exciting once I looked at Wiglet's stats. But once you've gone as far as you can, you're once again pushed towards your real main objective, education. The school section of the game is the final part where I have a major issue. It's slow, there's lots of cutscenes, and even on your first playthrough, it just isn't that engaging. It very much feels like the last day of school before summer vacation, and you're just waiting for the final bell to ring so you can go outside and chew through a fence. Or maybe it feels more like a much worse version of the mystery dungeon Wigglytuff Guild but eventually you're off the leash. And this is where these games really hit their stride. This doesn't discount the issues with frame rate, performance, or the bad pacing of the early game, but holy cow, is it good. Pokemon is a game that has always had exploration as a central theme, but this is the first game where you can actually explore. In the past, there was always a set next place you needed to go to, and you couldn't progress the story until you'd done it. But here, you can go wherever you want and do whatever you want. This feeling of freedom is heightened by the fact that exploration is so rewarding in these games. The developers have hidden rare Pokemon in areas that are hard to get to and off the beaten path. So by leaning into your own sense of discovery, you can stumble upon them and get access to powerful Pokemon earlier than you'd otherwise be able to. In this way, I think that the open world format is a perfect fit for a franchise like Pokemon. The wonder I felt exploring this game's world far outstripped anything the franchise has made me feel since leaving childhood. Of course, not everything is sunshine and rainbows after the tutorial. Before I get to maybe the game's biggest offense, I want to address the lack of clothing and accessory options. It's not something I personally care about, but I know a lot of people do, and I think it's a valid point. Gen 6 through 8 did a great job at adding more and more customization options, but Scarlet and Violet only allow you to mix and match your clothing within the Academy's uniform guidelines aka Dorktown USA. To many people, character customization plays a big factor in their enjoyment, allowing them to immerse themselves more in the game and add another goal to strive for. Scarlet and Violet did, however, add way more facial and hair customization options, and for that, I must commend it. Okay, time for my biggest issue with the game, something that I even pointed out during my initial review, the lack of level scaling. Generation 9 was the first true open world Pokemon game in the sense that you could tackle the gyms and bosses in any order that you want. But when these battles are locked to a specific level, it really takes away from the premise. Now, I understand locking the levels of wild Pokemon, but keeping progression relevant battles to a specific level indirectly creates an order for them. For instance, if you wanted to explore the map in a counterclockwise direction, save for a few outliers, everything would be fine and dandy. Until you get to the other half of the map, wherein your battles would become easier and easier until you arrived at the point you started at. And that's only if you want to tackle all three stories at the same time. If you want to go through them one at a time, you'll find yourself massively overleveled for the other two. It just doesn't make any sense to me why they'd make this a choose your own adventure style game, but punish us for choosing our own adventure. I do think that the way the game is designed really encourages you to follow the preferred route. I know I mostly did, despite not knowing what it was, but this does feel counterintuitive to the game's open world promise. I think the hardest thing about being an adult Pokemon fan is balancing the knowledge of what the series could be with the understanding of what it actually is. What sucks about Scarlet and Violet is that, in my opinion, it's the closest we got to that ideal vision. Picture it. A seamless, 3D environment with overworld Pokemon everywhere you look. And yet, it feels like year after year, despite many things getting better, fans are constantly left disappointed. Part of this has to do with these expectations. It's so hard to judge a Pokemon game for what it actually is because of all the past games and our own expectations for what we think a modern game should be. This is an aside, but I do wonder if we'd perceive games differently if the online space treated the release of games with more nuance. It feels like nowadays when a game releases, the internet reacts one of two ways. Either it's a total waste of money and a ripoff and a scam, or it's game of the year. And if it's the former, I wonder if people are more likely to notice and be bothered by the issues in the games because of how people discuss it. I don't have an answer. I just think that it's interesting. Does negativity create more negativity? Does 
positivity create more positivity? How would the average Pokemon fan actually feel about Scarlet and Violet if they experienced it away from the influence of the internet? We can't answer these questions, so let's return to the questions we can answer. Why did Scarlet and Violet turn out the way they did even after three years to prepare? Well, if you ask me, I do think that the Switch could handle Scarlet and Violet just fine, but because of time constraints, a small development team and lack of experience creating open world games, Game Freak was probably doomed to fail from the very beginning. I would argue it's a miracle that these games even released in the state that they did. Now, this isn't me excusing everything I just complained about. None of these limitations should be the reason for the poor decisions I've discussed so far. It does, however, explain whatever is going on here. The truth is, although Scarlet and Violet aren't perfect, they did what we had been begging for since the very beginning and delivered a breath of fresh air the series was in desperate need of. And this is reflected in their sales. In spite of all the backlash, Scarlet and Violet sold over 10 million copies over their launch weekend, making them Nintendo's highest selling software of any platform within three days of release and the biggest launch of any console exclusive in history. Some of you might be wondering how this could possibly be true. Well, like I said earlier, not everyone cares about performance and not everyone is terminally online. A ton of the discourse on the internet comes from an extremely small percentage of the user base. Scarlet and Violet is currently the third best-selling Pokemon game of all time and is on pace to become the second highest selling behind only Red and Blue. I think sometimes people forget that Pokemon is the highest earning media franchise in the world. The amount of people who consume Pokemon content and don't know or or care that these games are riddled with bugs completely drowns out those who do. This is a double-edged sword in some respects. It means that Pokemon is doing well, which for fans of the series is a good thing, but it also means there's way less incentive for Pokemon to make a big change or even take much of the criticism too seriously. No matter what people say online, the real way that Pokemon's gonna judge their game's success is very likely in the sales. And sometimes it's easy to forget that there is a lot to like about even the games with lots of issues. One thing in particular comes to mind this gen, the Pokemon, the main reason we play these games. Gen 9 delivered in spectacular fashion, becoming one of my personal favorite generations across the board. Not only did they introduce a ton of amazing Pokemon from a casual angle this generation, Generation 9 was a treasure trove for competitive players. There are so many completely innovative and unique moves and abilities. Rage Fist, Revival Blessing, Zero to Hero, Commander. These all led to unique strategies I'd never even considered. It felt like Pokemon was pushing the boundaries further than they ever had before. And honestly, I think they hit it out of the park. I'm not sure how the general public feels about terrestrialization, but I can tell you that for me, it ended up being even better than I'd anticipated. There are still new ways to use it being found all the time, making it feel fresh and exciting even after a whole year of being out. Out of the four major mechanics, I strongly believe terrestrialization is the best and the one where players have the most freedom. It's an incredibly exciting mechanic with big implications offensively and defensively and giving players another lever in team building allows for even more skill expression. My only gripe with it is how difficult it is to change your Terra type in game. The amount of grinding you have to do is almost comical. The Terra shards you get for beating a raid is at best around seven, and changing a Terra type a single time requires 50 shards for each Pokemon. This has been a chore the entire year as a competitive player, and I am so glad that the DLC increased the shards you can get from raids. Too bad I can't finish the DLC because the frame rate makes me motion sick. And terrestrialization being so good is a reflection of the competitive scene as a whole. Scarlet and Violet had one of the best first years of competitive play that we've had maybe ever. The new Pokemon, items, abilities, and moves all blended smoothly into multiple healthy competitive metagames. Pokemon that were difficult but rewarding to use took the spotlight with Palafin becoming a main competitive threat despite struggling initially to get off the ground. Despite fear about Fluttermane blowing the other Paradox Pokemon out of the water, many of these ancient and futuristic Pokemon had great showing. So many Pokemon and strategies could be used that nearly every player could find a way to play the game in a way that felt good to them. And with all these tools at their disposal, they could find creative ways of making their teams work. This didn't last forever. With the release of Pokemon Home and the return of key players like Landorus T, Urshifu, Heatran, and Tornadus, Pokemon diversity has dropped a fair bit. But I don't think it's fair to criticize Scarlet and Violet for this. None of these problem Pokemon come from this generation. 
and the game was perfectly fine before they showed up. And despite these centralizing Pokemon returning, there's still plenty of room for creativity, albeit maybe less than there was before. Something we haven't even talked about yet is the story. Now, let's be honest. Playing a Pokemon game for the story is kind of like watching a Wolfie VGC video for the neat hair. You're going to be disappointed. For me, mainline Pokemon games and terrible storytelling go hand in hand. Scarlet and Violet have three stories, so you would think that it'd be three times worse in this department, right? Wrong. They have the best story in any mainline game ever. Not exactly sure how I went from being such a Pokemon story hater to its handsome knight in shining armor, but I'm all in. Each one tugged at my heartstrings, made me laugh, and created a sense of excitement. I couldn't wait to see how the plots unfolded and where each character would end up. And what really ties it all together is the final story, once you've completed each of the individual ones. The Path of Legends storyline is hands down the best of the three. The way they turn Arvin from a jerk to one of the most lovable characters in the game is truly a masterclass in character development. Getting to help him heal his Mabostiff is such a heartwarming moment after every boss fight, and I couldn't wait to get to the next Titan to heal it some more. Originally, I had Victory Road ranked in last place, but when I wrote my original review, I hadn't even beaten the Elite Four yet. This one's so bare bones that it barely feels like a story, and the only really memorable gym leader was Larry because I mean, he's Larry. Where the storyline really shines, though, is your interactions with Pneumonia, who, as I mentioned in my review, is the best rival since N. She's fun, charming, and doesn't feel like your cheerleader the way that How and Hop did. What makes her stand out especially is that she's already a champion ranked trainer, meaning she already beat the Elite Four and she's just doing this all over again for fun. She wants you to be on her level, so she urges you to head to the next gym and tests you along the way. I think this distinction is really important because normally you spend all game beating your rival up, so when you finally beat them in, you know, the champion fight or whatever, it doesn't really feel special. Even though you do spend all game beating up Pneumonia, it feels different because she's clearly holding back in a way that no past rival has been. Your final confrontation with Pneumonia is actually your first real battle with her, and it's not easy. I actually lost my first time. But that moment after you take out her last Pokemon and she congratulates you for becoming the best trainer in Paldea, I really feel like they finally nailed a good rival storyline. The story I've soured the most on is Starfall Street, mostly because of how predictable it is. I do still think the way it utilizes auto battling is fun the first time, and the boss fights are actually challenging. And the ending wraps the story up in a sweet way. But the characters here feel a little weaker than in the other stories, and although all three stories are repetitive, Team Star felt the most samey. On the plus side, this story has some of the best music the game has to offer with its Team Star boss battle theme. Pneumonia's champion battle and the Terra Raid Den themes are also bangers. Speaking of Terra Raids, they're actually a lot more fun than I expected. Because of how fast they go and all the rewards you get from each one, they're always in demand when you choose to play online. Game Freak also continuously updates the games with six star raids that hold rare Pokemon, sometimes ones that aren't even in the game yet. These raids are so challenging that you'll find metas forming around them. Sword and Shield's golden max raid dens are baby mode compared to these. You actually have to build your Pokemon in a really specific way to even stand a chance against a powerful six star raid Pokemon. My hope is that this can be a gateway for people looking to get into VGC, but only time will tell. It's only been a year after all. So how do things look for the future of Scarlet and Violet? Well, as of June, 2023, they've sold over 22 million copies. In-game terror raids are still going strong with Game Freak holding online events for them almost every weekend. And the competitive ladder continues to remain fresh and healthy. Unfortunately, the game still has the same visual issues it had on release though the more severe bugs have at least been patched out. At the end of the day, no, Scarlet and Violet are definitely not perfect, but I have so much fun playing these games that I can't help but love them. And there is a lot to love. The stories, the open world, the Pokemon, the mechanic, the competitive scene. Scarlet and Violet got so much right. So were Scarlet and Violet actually as bad as we thought? I don't think so. And despite that, I'm hoping that Generation 10 will be even better.